Hi, this is Dr. Cairns with a brief lecture on managing teams in conflict and how it influences our Christian worldview and vice versa. This lecture has been influenced by the work of Dr. Clayton Christensen, an economics professor at the Harvard Business School and author of the article and book entitled How Will You Measure Your Life? as well as the late Dr. Richard C. Tuning and his work on biblical integration in business, and then Timothy Keller's book, Every Good Endeavor. Confucius said, without reflection, there can be no learning, and if there's no learning, it's dangerous. So this lecture has been designed for us to reflect on the things that we've learned in managing teams in conflict. I trust you enjoy it. This lecture is going to examine how developing competencies in group processes, communication, conflict resolution, and leadership can assure that we have strong, sustainable relationships. And then by developing these competencies, we'll also assure that we have a career we're passionate about and fulfills a higher sense of purpose. As well as developing these competencies, we'll assure that we grow spiritually and live a life of integrity and meaning. This last one, Dr. Christensen in his economics classes would say, how can we use economic theories and principles to assure we stay out of jail? Usually when he poses that question, he gets a little rise and a, a laugh out of his students. And then he goes on to explain that the reason he asked that is that one of his classmates was Kenneth Lay, the CEO of the failed company Enron. We're also going to examine how does scripture apply to help us develop these competencies and then also how can developing these competencies influence our faith journey. So first of all we're going to examine what is a biblical worldview. And God created the world and it was good. We see that in Genesis but that's how things were supposed to be. However we know that sin entered the world and it's fallen. So what is the solution and how can it be realized? A Christian worldview would say it's realized through Jesus. So therefore all scripture is inspired by God and it's useful to teach us. God uses it to prepare and equip his people to do every good work. And so my biblical worldview is going to be influenced by my engagement with others and in this case managing teams in conflict. So how do faith and work and work and faith fit together? Keller identifies eight different ways that various faith traditions view the best way to serve God at work. Each one of you has had an opportunity to select the one that you fit best for you. However, we also recognize and realize there are other ways that other people in the workplace are serving God as well. So there's not one best way, but there is a way that may be best for you. But what's most important is to know that my faith is not separated from my work. And so therefore we read in James where you can no more show me your works apart from your faith than I can show you my faith apart from my works. In other words, our faith and work are not compartmentalized, but are fully applied and integrated. So how can having sustainable relationships be accomplished? So we look at the we not me orientation that we read about uh, in our text and, ex and really by just closely examining me we find out that what we have is we turned upside down. And so we really need to recognize that a we mentality is one that does nothing out of selfish ambition or vain conceit. Rather in humility we value others above ourselves not looking to our own interests but to the interests of others. So it's important for us to really recognize that sustainable relationships uh, cannot be accomplished without a we mentality. Sustainable relationships also need supportive behavior and we see we also have defensive behaviors and when I first put this slide together I kind of glossed over in my own mind saying you know what I don't engage in defensive behaviors I really engage in supportive behaviors but when I closely examined the defensive behaviors I had to say you know what I have some areas that I need to improve upon because actually the first one control is what makes a good leader and a good manager but it's how you control people that's the most important and so I'm looking at having the Holy Spirit produce in me the fruit of the Spirit which is love joy peace patience kindness goodness faithfulness gentleness and self-control 
And Paul writes, there's no law against these things. Why does he write that? He writes it because the Jews were under Roman law and there were laws that, that prohibited actions by the Jews. And so Paul wanted to make sure that they knew that these things they could engage in because there was no law against them. And so we also recognize there's no law against supportive behaviors. And so for me, I need to make sure that I practice them. One thing that I can make sure that I realize that's going to happen in my relationships is conflict. Uh, that's really front and center of most of our lives. It's one of the reasons we actually change. Uh, but I need to realize that there are a variety of different styles that can be utilized to achieve a positive outcome to conflict. We know from examining our styles that we have one preferred style that we go to, but we really need to recognize that we may need to shift into another style based upon whatever that context may require. And so recognizing the Lord's watching everywhere, keeping an eye on both evil and good, and, and realizing that the wise, if they have appealing information and knowledge, that that will be much better and beneficial to resolving conflict than belching out some kind of foolishness. So recognizing that how I react and respond to conflict initially will also be helpful in resolving it. So how can I also use scripture to help me have a career I'm passionate about and looking at managing teams and conflict? We find that developing goals is very critical to an organization. Developing clear goals, goals that require the cooperation of individuals, goals that really make a difference and ones that people get behind. Those kinds of goals are the same goals that I desire for myself spiritually to be able to grow. Recognizing that writing them down is important and, and also uh, making sure that I realize that achieving and accomplishing those goals is really through the favor of God and God who gives me strength. I like this particular one, Dewey's Reflective Thinking Process. It helps us when it comes to setting agendas for meetings, and we've all been in death by meeting, but also from a career standpoint, committing to God whatever we're going to want it to accomplish and realize that he establishes our plans. And we are part of making that planning process. And so sitting down and, and constructing uh, in a thoughtful way a career that we want to pursue and then setting out to pursue that and then God will open those doors for us and us to pass through. Growing spiritually and living a life of integrity and meaning. Spell the word shop out loud. S-H-O-P. What do you do when you come to a green light? If you said stop, you're like the rest of us. How do you spell joke? J-O-K-E. What do you do and call the white of an egg? you said yolk, you responded quickly. What is this? This is inferential error. It's uncritical thinking. However, we all engage in inferences. We act on insufficient information. Our minds are geared to be able to extrapolate from insufficient information. Have you ever finished the sentence of someone? That's the result of inferential error because sometimes you may have gotten it right and other times you'd finished it wrong. I'll eventually be guessing to finish the sentence from my wife and eventually she'll get so frustrated and say, why don't you just stop and let me finish my thought. So it's important for us to test everything and hold fast to what is good. And don't judge by appearances, but judge the right things. Growing spiritually in a life of integrity. I like this one on the Eight Commandments. I don't know what happened to the other two. Maybe you could fill them in. But in terms of what the Son of Man has done, he came to serve and not to be served. What better way that for me to uh, live a life of integrity uh, by serving others? And sometimes that may be in a leadership capacity. In other areas, it may be by me being a more effective team member. It may be me being a supportive uh, employee uh, and a, or a colleague. So a variety of different things are important. So in conclusion, you reap what you sow, or in business we call that a return on investment. So if I want sustainable relationships and a career that I'm passionate about has meaning and purpose, 
and also live a life of integrity is going to be the direct result of how much time, effort, persistence, and commitment I put into it. And so I have some scriptures related there uh, in my particular faith tradition, how I view serving God at work as being the best and most skilled I can be. And so I find in Proverbs, do you see someone skilled in their work? They will serve before God. They will not serve before officials of low rank. And this particular one is really God is the one who elevates. I want to give God something to work with, so I want to be as highly skilled as I possibly can. In Ecclesiastes, though, I find that without perspective, that what man gains by all his toil uh, really is, is uh, senseless. So I really need to make sure that I finish the race uh, and by seeking the kingdom of God. On your right you see Patty Fenton. Patty is a dairy farmer uh, in the southern part of Ireland and my wife and I a few years ago met him. And uh, he was sharing with us what it was like to uh, grow up uh, as a farmer. Uh, and he's leaning against the doorpost of the the room where he was born and, and it's still uh, on his uh, family property. In fact, it's uh, where his son and uh, daughter-in-law and their uh, son live uh, now and it's a small little room. But he told us a story, what is it all when all is told? And I'd like to say that to you now. What is it all when all is told, the ceaseless toil for fame or gold? The fleeting joy of bitter tears were only here but a few short years. Nothing's our own, save the silent past, loving or hating, no thing can last. Each pathway leads to a silent ford. Oh, what is it all when all is told? What is it all a grassy mound where day or night tis ne'er a sound, save the soft low moan of the fanning breeze as it lovingly rustles the silent trees, where thoughtful friend with whispered prayer may sometimes break the stillness there, then hurries away from the gloom and the cold. Oh, what is it all when all is told? What is it all just passing through, a cross for me, a cross for you? Ours seems heavy while others seems light, but God in the end makes all things right. He tempers the mind with loving care, he knows the burden that each can bear, then turns life's gray into lovely gold. But what is it all when all is told? You reap what you sow. That's all I have to say about that. Fear God do what he tells you. Thank you for listening and engage in the uh, quiz that's attached to this.